We're going to go ahead and get started then, everybody. Thanks for being here so much. I am Claudia Taylor, and I'm Director of Regional Programming for the UNT Alumni Association. Uh, and welcome to episode two of UNT Alumni Live. Today, we are thrilled to welcome jazz violinist and UNT College of Music faculty member Scott TTA. You all know how extraordinary UNT's music students and faculty are, and Scott is no exception. So today we're very excited to share some stories from his incredible career. Uh, first, some housekeeping. Uh, if you're joining us on Zoom, please check out the chat section at the bottom of your screen. I'll be posting uh, some useful links there, and, and you can also use that to send uh, questions directly to me for Scott. If you're watching on Facebook Live, please leave us a comment. Uh, or a question and make sure you share the video so others can uh, join in. Uh, we'll also have a link to a survey in the Zoom chat and in the Facebook comments. Uh, fill that out and be entered to win a UNT prize pack. Uh, and of course, we're trying our best to master Zoom like everybody else on the planet right now. So please forgive us if there are any technical hiccups, we will try to fix them as fast as we can. Okay, now before I hand the program over to Casey, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our featured guest. Scott TTA. Originally from France, Scott studied classical violin at the Conservatory in Paris before moving to New York, where he performed at Carnegie Hall and Madison Square Garden, but also taught violin in an after school program in Queens and pretty much everything in between. <laughs> he has toured, performed, and recorded with Pink Floyd, Elton John, Ed Sheeran, and many others, and has appeared on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, America's Got Talent, and many more. His work has been featured in motion picture soundtracks, including last year's The Lion King, John Wick, and the new Spike Lee film coming to Netflix later this year. Just last month, he received his Grammy certificates for his work on The Lion King, as well as on John Legend's 2019 Christmas album. And since 2018, he has been an assistant professor of violin and director of the jazz string lab band right here at the University of North Texas. Today, we're going to hear some stories from Scott's incredible career so far and find out how he manages to balance his packed teaching schedule with recording and performing with music industry heavyweights. Casey, take it away. Thank you so much, Claudia. And thank you for all of you for logging in, being a part of Zoom and joining us on Facebook Live. Guys, just a quick reminder, if you have any questions for Professor Tixier, or as I like to call him, Scott, uh, <laughs> then go ahead and send those directly to Claudia. She'll send those to me to, to get to Scott. So um, please, he's, he's an open book. He'll answer almost anything, I think. No, not so much. Okay, he's, he's giving me the nod. No, don't do that. <laughs> That's all right. Um, guys, I don't know if, how many of you guys are familiar with Scott or gotten to know him or seen him around or even his, his social media, but this, this cat is, is super talented and super fun to talk to. So thank you. Thank you, Scott, for being here, taking time out of your day to talk to us. How are you doing today? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm a little bit shy with a lot of people. I'm a, Oof. Don't um, look at them. You hear me, yes. buddy? You got this. Uh, no. All right. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be here, and um, uh, it's a pleasure to participate to this uh, online um, uh, meeting. I guess like to to talk about um, whatever you want to talk about, but also to just gather together. I think it's nice to to be uh, to be here in Texas. As you can see, I have uh, the outfit outfit of Texas. <laughs> nice. I like that you dress for the occasion. We appreciate yes, that. Always, always. So Scott, um, this program was designed to really build awareness and pride for our alumni, for the general public, for parents and students. And so to have someone like you as a guest on here is, is really special. I know that when I met you last year at a College of Music event that I was fortunate enough to be able to attend, um, it was a real treat to meet you and you were so warm and welcoming. And then when I turned around, I saw your face again, but you were just standing right there and I was so confused and I went, what is happening? Oh, and you it and was my twin, no, it, <laughs> it was your twin. No. Is, is Tony <laughs> joining us today? Is, is he joining I us? Tried. Live I, I just texted him that um, he hasn't uh, responded to my call because I think in Paris right now, it's a, uh, it's um, 11 p.m. Okay. in Paris. It, it is right. in Paris. So, yes. Sorry. Um, uh, 
Proceed, please. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're totally fine. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the courts. Of... I, I'm really curious, though, to know who in our audience is joining us from the furthest away, you know? So if you're not in Denton or the DFW Metroplex or even South Texas, where we host a lot of our alumni programs, you know, shoot Claudia a, a message and let her know where you're joining us from. We'd be really interested to know where you're at. So, Scott. Yes. Listen. I've seen some really great photos of you circulating through the internet and uh, you with your violin, you, you, you photograph beautifully. Um, but I just want you to know that you are not the only one that can oh. have their, you are oh, not yeah, the only no. one that has know, a photo. I know with, exactly what you, where are you going? With their instrument. Uh, That's right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, 1999. And it you, didn't happen if you didn't get your photo taken with it. Right. Yeah. Uh, I will work on that uh, for sure. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm speechless. I'm You're speechless. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, Scott, I clearly chose low brass to play, uh, but you yeah. you picked up the violin at a very young age. Can you tell us yes. a little bit about that? So, yeah, when I was like, a, um, when I was, I grew up in Paris first, so in a, in the suburbs of Paris. So not really in Paris, about 20, 25 minutes um, from Paris. And uh, I was like, um, my, my parents are both artists. And uh, so my, my father is an, is an actor and my, my mom, she's a dance, uh, and choreograph dancer and choreographer. So she's a teacher as well. And um, so we were listening to a lot of music at, at home with my twin brother. And uh, by the age uh, of three, three years old, they put us in a initiation for music at the conservatory uh, near Paris. It was a small, uh, small conservatory, and it was only to to learn like the basic of music, you know. So uh, percussion, uh, uh, piano, things like so, that. You know? So you started learning music and how to read music before most kids learn to read uh no so at free we are not studying reading we are just like um basically having uh, a connection contact with the instrument basically so okay. they just put us in a room and uh, and yeah made us at the conservatory so it was kind of a uh, nice only focused on music and by the time i was five years old um i, I started solfege so I wanted to start violin. I, I saw a documentary um, on on the channel channel five. At the time, we we had we had only five channels in the, in France, and it was black and white. I think if I remember. And uh, <laughs> you're not that old, right? I'm pretty old actually. I look young, <laughs> but I'm 34. So I mean, it's been a while. Uh, okay. um, so, so so I remember hearing like the the, Mond the Mondelssohn concerto. And uh, and the violin uh, concerto, and uh, I was uh, I was really uh, intrigued by the sound, but I didn't know what it was. So I asked my parents if I could uh, pick up this instrument, and uh, so they said, "Yeah, sure." So uh, I went to the conservatory and asked for this, and they told me, "No." They said, "No, it's not possible. You have to do one year of solfege before picking an instrument. You must. Uh, it's required by the policy." So. I did one year of solfege, <laughs> and when I was six years old, I picked the violin. Uh, I remember going to to Paris to pick it up because it was a uh, at the time we can get a violin for free uh, from a, a good luthier from a, um, um, Mircourt. So it's a it's a um, violin uh, making uh, a school in a in the um, center of France. Okay, it's called Mircourt. So they do like violin. Uh, like the master litier. So, and I got a violin like this um, for me. And it was, uh, it was nice. And uh, I remember going to, to my, to my um, back to the conservatory and just uh, opening the case. Um, I have vivid uh, memories about this. So I remember opening the case and taking the bow. And then the teachers told me to, to stop. She said, no, you cannot touch the bow. We have to do pizzicato for for like month and month before you can even touch your bow. <laughs> so I was really wow. frustrated. But um, yeah, I still remember that. So that was how I started music. <laughs> Very cool. Hey, so 
obviously you've been doing this for quite some time. And if you look up Scott Tixier on, on Wikipedia, there are words used like uh, child prodigy and uh, you know, you've been reviewed yeah, by but, Downbeat Magazine and you've, you've yeah, but had- this, most people be- it's it's always like you know like the prodigy thing is like uh, it's always uh, I'm careful with this because it's always like marketing and uh, and you know people like to exaggerate all the time but uh, I think you're just being humble. <laughs> yeah, but day, uh, um, if there's only one Mozart, you know, and it's not me. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Well, hey, <laughs> we've got a lot of people wondering what brought you to unt how did that happen how oh. did that develop i mean wow this is pretty remarkable to to find a guy a, a french violinist jazz violinist and bring you to texas <laughs> i mean that's a, a, a amazing question because actually uh to be honest i didn't know unt before and uh, i'm not saying that to because i didn't know anything honestly i didn't know unt and even though i i've been uh, giving some class uh, at Juilliard, sometimes I was coming uh, um, as a guest or even like uh, doing um, private lessons for students at Juilliard and things like this. I, I didn't really know the impact of any university because I was really focused on being on the scene, like playing uh, the, the gigs uh, outside of schools. So I moved to New York when I was uh, about 19 years old and I didn't speak any English. Um, I didn't know anything about America. <laughs> But what I knew, uh, that uh, there in New York City, there are jazz. I just know that it was the, the place to be for jazz musicians. So I just moved there at 19 with no money, nothing. And uh, my parents were a little bit freaked out, but, uh, me too. And, uh, and then eventually, uh, it took me years and years, but uh, eventually uh, I started making a living playing music and uh, a good living at some point. <laughs> and uh, eventually... <laughs> Eventually, um, one day I, I got an email on uh, a message on Facebook from Regina Carter. She's a great violinist, and she told me uh, that uh, UNT was looking for a jazz violin professor or alternate uh, alternate uh, styles. You know? So I was really intrigued because I was teaching already uh, in different um, format and not necessarily at the university um, like full time, but I was uh, doing things at Princeton University. Or um, other uh, things in the uh, Montreal, Montreal thing. Uh, Montreal, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, Miguel, Miguel University thing. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I I was doing things that is when I was doing a tour, basically. I was going there and doing a master class or workshop somewhere there, like uh, at a uh, Redger, Redger University, I think too. And, right. Um, so all those things. So I I knew a little bit um, what you expect, and. Uh, I I was been teaching since since I was uh, 17 but more in France. Wow. So I was intrigued so I just checked it out and um I didn't know anything about Texas except that people each, each time I start start saying I'm going to Texas or I'm going to check 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 it out and they were like wow uh, from New York to Texas man you you shouldn't you should stay in New York everybody was kind of scared for me so I was wondering why and uh, nah, no, 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 <laughs> so, no, so, no, so, no, no, so yeah, sure. I think it's just like, it's like, you know, like when people say Paris is the city of love, you know, and um, people have, have a, pre- a prejugé, a cliche, uh, pre-made, uh, preconceived ideas. And I think everywhere in the world, there's like, uh, there's people that are um, going to disappoint you and some people are going to make you inspired. So I, I don't think it's a bad the, the place. So about the people, um, and, and we don't ride horses everywhere we go, and we don't wear cowboy hats everywhere. So yeah. I, you even know. if it was true, the thing with music is like um, there's no like I, I've been teaching uh, people from so many different backgrounds, and uh, we we meet at the same place. We meet with music. We meet in a place where we we all the same almost. Like it's like there's no difference. Whether you are really uh, uh, from the countryside of a, a big city, uh, or if you are, um, you know, whatever religion or uh, um, ethnic, ethnic uh, cultural background, when we meet for music, especially for jazz music and uh, any music, I think, but um, I'm talking about what I know, um, we meet there and we're looking at this as something that is. Uh, 
kind of uh, bring us together and we're looking at this thing and then this thing is like it's connecting us and so it's 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 very interesting because I, i've been teaching like really like from different places in the world like different continents when i went to china um uh to to um Cote d'Ivoire in west africa um in uh, russia all those things it is always like it's so far away it seems so far away but as soon as i get there and we talk about music i feel like i'm home so it's like right uh, exactly so, yeah. and yeah. and as you know unt is you know, known for our music program. And I, I love the story that you have about how you kind of interviewed for Dean Richmond. Can you tell us a little bit about how that went down in the conversation there? Because that's pretty special. Everything or just uh, the part I can't, uh, because I cannot talk about everything, I'm, I'm sure. Right, no, 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 I, no, should, no. I should use my uh, my um, cover to do that. I have a friend okay. here, he's, he's always- uh, Oh, uh, <laughs> you've got a friend there. Yeah, he's, he's a bit shy, but he might come after. <laughs> All right. uh, so, uh, so, did he attend the interview for you whenever you interviewed with Dean Richmond? <laughs> um, I think about what I've been not so good because it's kind of crazy. Oh, I didn't funny. attend the interview. <laughs> well, Sorry. how did you, uh, more specifically, when you spoke with Dean Richmond <laughs> the first time? All right. So, um, so uh, sorry, I, I can be serious too. You know, I'm I'm, I'm taking it like, uh, but I, I'm a serious person. You know? so, um, no, you're not. So you're not. I didn't. I never negotiate my salary. Or, or no, I don't want to know about your salary. I want to oh, know sorry. where did, where did Dean Richmond get to see you perform? What did you tell him? Oh, oh okay. Sorry, sorry. You so, with me? Um, yeah, so uh, the dean and, and the rest of the, of the committee, like the rest of the professor, asked me, um, could we see uh, per you perform like soon? Because we'd like to see, uh, do you have a, a performance soon in New York or a live, something we can see on, on internet? And I said, sure, uh, tomorrow I'm playing on the Grammys with Elton John. <laughs> so, no big deal. <laughs> Just another day in the life. <laughs> it was perfect timing. I was I was excited because uh, I usually don't play with Elton John, and uh, it was my first time playing with uh, in his band. So and it was with uh, Chris Martin as well. Was the Very cool. Player. So it was so, really a good good uh, perfect timing for me. Absolutely. So were you nervous knowing that you were a playing with Elton John for the first time on the Grammys, and it's kind of an interview. Yes. It was it was very exci exciting and I, and I was like um, quite honestly I was um, I, I wasn't thinking too much about getting a job or, or I was just doing that by curiosity because I was really excited to I, I'm always excited to talk about music and share music so I'm not I'm not looking for a career or uh, I'm just I try to do what I like so very good uh, hey you, I did. <laughs> that's awesome hey I tell you what we've got a great question here. Um, Speaking yes. of teaching and all of that, it looks like someone wants to know what is Scott's advice for those advocating for young people that traditionally are left out of these opportunities? Claudia, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Maybe what, what exactly advocating for students that are wanting to perform in music or be a part of music? Is that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Scott, I know you've talked a little bit about your teaching experience in New York City and, and kind of teaching students who don't normally have access to like classical instruments, for example. So maybe talk a little bit about um, how you open those opportunities for students and how that's important, why that's important. Oh, so I can tell you, I can tell you, um, probably I can tell you why it's important, but I can tell you how it affects uh, my um, students and uh, what I, I experience myself, like in my personal uh, life, you know. But um, so I just think that once again, music, and I'm talking about music. So you could have, you can use your voice. You don't have to have an instrument, but uh, <laughs> you can use uh, over um, um, kind of a, of a expression like a dance, theater, artistic. I would say creative expression, even like. A, it's something that is really bring people together wherever you're from. So I, it's that's why I think, like for me, for myself, I grew up in a very poor family, even though we're artists. Uh, my parents were not wealthy and we didn't have any money. So we're living in a project actually um, in the suburbs of Paris and nobody was doing music in the building. 
but uh, the the music and the theater really make me made me feel um, special in a way. I felt like I was I was just an artist. That's why I was strugg we were struggling. <laughs> so and we we had something creative to look for. So um, I think it really opened me to different um, culture culture cultures and also so social. Um, um, a place where I would I wouldn't be able to to even like reach uh, or be part of if I, if I wasn't a musician. So I really think also it music at a young age age really teach more than music. It is discipline, uh, patience, and uh, also how to know yourself and uh, looking for for more. You know, so I think it has a it has this effect on on. Um, on kids, but also on ad adults. You know, but it's never too late to start. But when you start at a young age, that's really something that it's valuable for for the, the rest of your life. Even if you end up not being a musician professionally, like making a living out of it, I think it will it will stay uh, in you in you in a and show in different ways, like in your in your process. I I know for sure that um, people that don't have a uh, create creative outlets to express the the they deal with a lot of depression and sometimes they um they're trying to make sense of their life and it's it's difficult to and even when you have a, an artistic uh, thing but uh, it's even more difficult when you have, when you have nothing so i always thought music for me was um the place where i can um really like um, reach for for more uh, finding about other people Knowing, knowing more about myself, but also about like uh, people in general. Like, so it's I don't know. It's like I think it's important. Is I don't I don't even know if I answered your question. But um. no, this is this is fantastic. <laughs> so Scott, I think more than anything, especially given what's going on in our world right now, you know, there's a lot of emotions, a lot of thoughts, a lot of you know concerns. You know sounds to me like music is one place that we can turn to find some kind of outlet to to find some relief to to be creative and 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 know that collectively we're here as a community through music and that's pretty special um so I'm, i want to move on to another question for you and yes for sure people are wanting to know yeah. who <laughs> yeah don't go anywhere not even to get your coffee uh people are wanting to know who was your first major musical influencer um Oh, whether wow. it's a performer or a jazz artist it was my my dad no, I'm kidding. No, so. <laughs> <laughs> i hope he heard that i hope he knows that <laughs> you say you're kidding but i'm sure there's some truth to that yeah maybe, maybe it's true maybe it's true he's an actor he's really funny and uh, he always taught me how to be more than a musician he always say are you on stage or you're you're in your bedroom like just like looking at you at your foot <laughs> at your, uh, you need to look up and look behind the audience. You always tell me like, don't look, or just find somebody in the audience and just stare at at, at this person for the entire show. Or look <laughs> just behind them, so it looks like you look far away, and uh, the presence on stage would be well, well, uh, more pa powerful. So my my dad is an actor. He knows he knows nothing about music. It's it, it sings he it sings really bad. It's horrible the way he sings. But he's a French actor, so in, in France you can get away uh, being an actor just acting uh, uh, classical plays and not Broadway and singing and things like this. You no, know? like fantastic. Actor, it means, but uh, sorry, so let's talk about me. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm, I'm curious to know, like, who That's influenced you to play jazz? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, let's come back to the question. So uh, when I was like, uh, I was a, a young kid, probably around 12 years old. 12. I'm thinking. I was like doing a lot of classical music intensely, and I was uh, about I was about to to get some uh, good uh, things. Like I was uh, in the orchestra at the conservatory. I was playing the solo. I was serious. I wanted to be a concert concert master and a, uh, a solo player for career for, as a classical musician. And at 12, unfortunately, my plan changed because I discovered uh jazz music basically i mean i knew jazz music my mom was always playing jazz but i never pay m m much attention i was like oh this is just like the music from for my parents or in the background or something but one day i went to um like a, it was a, a one week um uh, like you know a camp with a class so it was mm -hmm. a in france where this we go one week doing ski it's free because 
the school is a place for it. So basically, you go one week uh, in the mountains with uh, when you're 12 and uh, with your professor of history or uh, math professor or whatever. It's uh, nothing, nothing to do with it. And then you do ski. And so I brought my violin there. And I was the only one in the class at the time doing the music. Uh, so I just brought my violin, entertained my, my classmates. Uh, and then the, I, I, I didn't, I was, uh, I didn't brought all my, my charts and my, my, my music sheets. So I, I couldn't play any, anything anymore. So I was like, wow. And I heard some music. It was uh, near the place where we were staying. And it was kind of a bar, but in France, we don't care. So I went in <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I saw this, uh, this, this uh, group of uh, people playing music together with a saxophone, drums and things. And I was like, oh, what, what is this? And I was wondering what they were doing. So they saw that I had my violin because I brought my, and they asked me to play with them. And I didn't know anything. So I said, I don't say just play. So I took an instrument and I played by ears. And uh, it was not, I'm sure it was not really good, but they told, the guy told me, wow, you sound like uh, Stefan Grappelli. <laughs> and I didn't know who uh, was Stefan Grappelli. But so I, when I went back at home, I checked, I, I went to the vinyl uh, store in Paris and I, I looked for Stefan Grappelli. I took a vinyl and I put it on. And when I, I was, that's it, I was, I was shocked. Uh, you you were hooked and yeah, and I've and that was, you're that was, an incredible improviser yeah is an is an is an, is incredible right uh, yeah, yeah absolutely so, and and the fact that you figured that out at such a young age is remarkable and you got out of your comfort zone you tried something new and you you fell in love at a very young age and now you're yeah you're so doing amazing things after that something something really um crazy happened it's like my twin at the same moment discovered also, um, like jazz, but in a different way, he, he, he went to Herbie, Herbie Hancock. So yes. <laughs> it was uh, very different from Stefan Gropoli. So he was playing in his bedroom. Uh, at the time, we, we had actually the same bedroom because uh, we are living in... The, something happened in my life and we changed. We moved to a different uh, place where it was because we... In the family, it's a, something happened with heritage. So we get like some money from the... Whatever. So my parents were able to afford a, a bigger house. House. So, That's anyway. so, um, uh, so. But before that, we we're in the same in the same room, and we start practicing, and uh, and eventually I discovered um, uh, John Coltrane, and yeah. and then I was like uh, spending my entire day from like 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. practicing, uh, basically just playing along with the recordings. So I was playing the vinyl on, and I was just playing with the recording along with it. And I did that for, for a couple of years um, until by an, my neighbor. Uh, uh, yeah, it was, so yeah, at 14, we changed. We went to, uh, to a place where we, were, we, were, we have our own house. But before that, we were in an apartment building. So I did that for a couple of years, I think. And then the neighbors called the police because there's too much, much music, too much music all the time. But uh, it was a long time ago. And I, I understand now. I mean, it must have been like if they uh, only knew what was happening around them. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah, so, so funny. So is that the only? No, I'm not going to ask if that's the only time you've ever had the police called on you. We're not going to go there. So um, yeah. <laughs> don't answer that, Scott. <laughs> Just yeah. kidding. Actually, it was, hey. the, it was the first time and last time. Oh, good. Okay, so he said that honestly. I, I love it. <laughs> I never know what's going to happen. Um, so Scott, I'm curious. What advice? would you give to parents that have children that are musicians and, or even interested in being musicians? Um, it sounds like you grew up in a really uh, unique family surrounded by artists. So the fact that maybe not every parent is a musician and they want to foster the child's growth and encourage them, how would you, what kind of advice would you offer to them? So first of all, uh, I would say um, I know a lot of people that are not musicians and their kids are musicians or sometimes uh, they are musicians and their kids are not musicians. So uh, music doesn't transfer like this. It's not because your parents are musicians that you're going to be a musician. And I think the, the big mistake that I've seen being a, a professor, a, a teacher for um, uh, like uh, a public school in New York, I've seen a lot of uh, young 
kids. Uh, and if you have an interest for music and you kids don't, don't force them, don't put, push them too much. Maybe you can try to convince them with a, in a way where they will get inspired by uh, showing them things, but don't force them to do music because that we end up making the opposite effects. They will probably hate, hate music and then, uh, I mean, uh, or this specific style of music and, and, and that's going to be, uh, that's not, never, never going to be good. So I think music comes in a way, um, if you're not exposed to it, that's going to be maybe difficult to find an interest for it. But I would say like, um, if your kid show, shows an interest for it, uh, encourage them and never um, always support them. No, to do Absolutely. if they don't want to do it, uh, try to find what they really like. It's just like anything in life, and don't. It's it's like everything. I think when it's forced, it it, it never lead anywhere. But I, by that, I don't say don't. Uh, my parents forced me to practice. No, because I show an interest for music. I was like, I love music, and I thought about it. And then right. sometimes, sometimes I didn't want to practice because right. I was uh, I was not disciplined sometimes. And they told me, no, you have to practice. And uh, and they forced me a little bit to say no uh, until you, you, this is this is your thing. You you have you put too much, too many years in it to stop now. When I wanted to stop, when I was 14 at some point, because I had some moment where I was not sure. My dad say you can you can stop now only when you're 18, when you be an adult. But right there you now, go. I choose. So I, it, I, I I keep it up, and you see, I'm up here. I didn't stop. <laughs> So. I'm so glad. And I'm so glad that they encouraged you to stick with it. And, you know, so, yeah, so it's a, it's a very uh, sensitive thing. Um, you have to, I think you, you just have to be careful um, to not uh, uh, bring your own frustration and uh, failures on your kids. I don't have any Absolutely. kids, so I don't know what I'm talking about, but uh, no, I'm you've done a great job. Say. <laughs> I've got two little ones and I'll say just watching them play sports and, you know, trying not to get too involved in everything and screaming and, you know, it translates through everything, just like you said, whether it's music or, or sports or any other hobby or activity, you know, it needs to be something that they enjoy. And I think you're absolutely correct there. Um, so here's an interesting question for you. It says, bear with me, guys, these contacts are drying out real fast. So it says, my <laughs> five-year-old attends a music magnet school here in Houston. Hey, welcome. So I am so glad we yeah. have somebody from Houston down there. And it ha actually happens to be Beyonce's elementary alma mater. So, hey, that's pretty neat. And this five-year-old is beginning violin and is also not allowed to use his bow. Or her boat. Uh, yeah. What is a reasonable amount of time to expect a young child to practice each day? Oh, that's a good question. Wow. Well, yeah, that's a good question, and uh, I'm still thinking about it at 34. So, uh, I, if I knew the answer, and so no, no, I'm kidding. So, of course, it is a good amount. So, I think practicing it's like a muscle. You have to, you have to, you have to be, you have to warm up to it. To be able to really uh, do uh, uh, more and more each time, and it's if you don't practice, then it's going to decrease. Uh, uh, so when I was a kid, my my thing was to practice ten minutes, ten minutes. When I was a kid, maybe I was like eight years old. I don't know. So seven years. I don't remember everything, but I just remember like at some point I was practicing ten or fifteen minutes. But practicing and playing are two different things. So you have to know what you practice and. It doesn't matter if you're young or if you're an older person. You have to know, you have to have a focus when you practice because if you don't, you're going to feel frustrated and you, you're not, not going to find an interest or an enjoyment to do it. It doesn't have to be fun all the time. So what I don't like, um, that I hear a lot in the, in America. Not, uh, not, uh, <laughs> no, like, you're uh, absolutely uh, right. My son says it all the time. Me, like, uh, when I was teaching, hey, make sure we have fun, make, make sure we have fun. And I, I had always a problem with that because I think fun should be a part of a practice moment, but this also should be some, um, I would say like some um, thing that are not fun, maybe like a, a question, a thing that you you can question yourself or you can be um, a, a little bit like, um, um, I you don't have know. You have to be willing to make you... mistakes. Yes, exactly. But like the fun part, happy, happy part of the time, it's not uh, it's not Disneyland, okay? It's not <laughs> we are doing a, we are doing a serious thing. 
I've never take myself seriously, but music is uh, is, is something very, uh, I would say, very deep, more than uh, just uh, um, so, uh, there's many layers to it. Absolutely. You cannot uh, just define it just uh, as as fun. So of course, there's a fun part, and it's important to to have this to be able to 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 balance it out with uh, the struggling part. And to uh, struggling, I, I mean by that uh, you have to do your research. You have to to find your own voice. You have to um, to understand the language or the tradition or whatever it is you know, you're working on. But um, so what I would say is like 10 minutes. Basically, you can start working on a, a bow control or scales, or it could be intonation for uh, string instruments, you know, things like this. But um, if you have a, a goal in your practice, then it's it's always uh, going to boost the 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 I would say like the engagement, you no. Know? So Absolutely. Um, so I do I try to do that myself. And it's good to have a routine, even at a young age. So what is a routine? It's like you have a, a notebook and you put uh, what you want to work on this week. And you don't have to work on the same thing every day, but a little bit um, some other thing you're going to do are going to be similar. It's, it's what it's called a routine. <laughs> so Set some goals. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Something to work so, towards. For example, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm going to give you an example. It's too technical, but uh, you know what I mean. So... Um, it's it's very uh, interesting, and I think uh, when because for a long time you're gonna you're gonna feel the pain here. I remember yeah. I couldn't hold my violin when I was a kid. At some point, I was tired. Of, it it hurts me. It hurted me. And I say mm-hmm. to my teacher, I remember it hurts, and she was saying to me, "I don't care. You keep going." Right. <laughs> yeah, so it's right. just Russian Russian method. So boom, <laughs> and then I was crying. I, was, I remember crying like crazy, <laughs> and she was like. You want to be a violinist or you don't want. Right. Uh, so it's when uh, we switched teacher because she was a bit too hard. <laughs> but to, to be and I, 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 she made me cry, but uh, it's okay. So because I had good uh, parents, so they make me feel good after when I come home. So, I but, love um, that. And uh, so, <laughs> so I remember that. And then now I don't even feel I can play like five hours. I don't even feel any pain uh, because great. I'm trained. So, and yeah. Love is psychological more to practice longer. So I think by the time you you're 14 years old, 13 years old, you can practice four hours. And I always say if you if you if you like very uh, um, efficient and focused, four hours will go pretty fast. It goes by fast, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I used to practice eight hours per day, but that was crazy, and I don't encourage you to do it because I was just uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I was I was I'm passionate, so I was just taking my instrument from the morning and to, to night until I, I couldn't even like uh, function. But I was not even practicing every other day. I was just like moving my, my hand. <laughs> I was lost. But uh, yeah, I remember I did nine hours sometimes like I, wow. because I was putting a, a timer to know. I was like That's happy when I did my nine hours. I was like, wow, I did cool. it. Even though I didn't learn anything. <laughs> but you can say you did it and that's all that counts yeah. right especially so, at that age hey yeah, yeah. scott i cannot believe how fast the time is flying by it is already 4 41 and i know so that sorry. no you're don't goodness <laughs> don't apologize this is all great stuff um there are so many things that i would love to have you talk and share about oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, more specifically I, why don't you tell us a little bit more about some of these I guess A-list musicians, celebrities, people that you've performed with, worked with. Who are your favorites? Um, and then so, I also want you to let the group know a little bit about the GQ performance that oh, yeah, GQ. came out today. That was super cool. So maybe we can start with that. Uh, okay. So get it out of, out of the way. So yeah, um, uh, two days ago, I think two days ago, my friend uh, is a great artist uh, from France, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to play. Uh, for him, for a live performance, like uh, live pre-record performance, and I say, sure, I can do it. And I said, uh, I'm gonna use my camera, uh, my phone, and I will use a microphone. Uh, and I, and then as a joke, I said, uh, yeah, I really want to try to look good on video. <laughs> I said, I mean, come on, so it's okay, it's just a performance. So yeah, it's not, it's not like I'm performing on GQ or something. I said, actually, yes, we're performing for GQ. <laughs> 
<laughs> you actually were GQ France. Guys, you can see the performance on, if you go to Instagram, the GQ France Instagram page, it, it was published today at one o'clock this afternoon. Yes. So check it out. It's pretty neat. Yeah. It's, in, it's on my, on my Instagram. You can see the link. So uh, yeah, for, for, for GQ, we had to, uh, to wait a, a world pandemic <laughs> to be able yes. to give me a gig on GQ. So I'm glad. Uh, thank you. Thank you, GQ. You waited a long time, but here we go. <laughs> so, no, so, for performance, so for the performance I did with uh, other artists. So w what is funny about the story, when I whenever I perform with Stevie Wonder or Ariana Grande, I don't know, um, like people like um, Gladys Knight has nothing to do with Ariana Grande. It's like the open, open yeah, those are totally <laughs> I don't. I, I perform for for movies and things like this. Like, uh, so what happened? It's funny because I never tried. I never did an audition in my life. Never did the audition. I never went to a casting or, or never. So what I did is, so I was just practicing in my in my place, practicing, practicing, and then I was going out playing some shows in jazz clubs in New York or wherever, and doing some tours with my bands. And I always meet somebody like. For example, when I played for David Letterman, I was in a club and I'm, this person came to me and she said to me, oh, uh, I like you playing and I would like to, uh, would you like to play with David Letterman? And she said, with David Letterman. So I didn't know who he was because I didn't, I don't have a TV. I don't own a TV. And at the time I didn't really watch anything on the internet. So I was just like focused on my music. So I said, sure, I love playing with singers because I thought he was a singer. And she started laughing and she thought I was making a joke, but I was serious. And then a week later, I was on David Letterman with, uh, with Zed, the DJ. It was his first TV on, in America. And she was, this girl was a music director for David Letterman for the, for the strings. She was a string contractor. So she right. hired a string quartet. So these kind of things. And, and, and then for Stevie Wonder, um, same thing. It always happened because I, somebody mentioned my name, and then they called me, and the assistant of CB Wonder was and knew me. And so, uh, anyway, so what I learned um, playing with um, people like Stevie, for example, Steve, Stevie Wonder is like uh, everybody knows him. Of course, he's a, he's a genius and a, an amazing. Uh, he, he wrote so many uh, iconic uh, songs, but um, also the way he, wor he, he works, he works. It's like so um, focused on music. If there's no, uh, I would say it's, he has a very good heart. He's very humble. He's very open. And he makes you, he makes you feel comfortable. And uh, everything is really um, focused on the music. And he's, he's very um, organic in a way he directs uh, his band. So he um, doesn't try to control. It's very like he lets the music happen and he's, he's trying to, to, to be as relaxed as possible. The same thing with Elton John, That's believe amazing. it or not. Uh, Elton John was the same kind of vibe. And then uh, other people, uh, a little bit less uh, uh, experienced, maybe like they're still great, like, you know, younger, younger people like Ed Sheeran. Uh, sure. uh, most people they also have the same vibe, but you can see that they're still, um, um, they're still figuring, figuring it out. You know, they're, they're not totally relaxed. No, this kind of some tension with engineers. Find who they are. Yeah. Yeah, but people like Stevie or Elton John or uh, the Isley Brothers or I don't know. Pink Floyd. Uh, yeah, Pink Floyd. Uh, yeah, the Pink Floyd. Um, Rod Roger Waters. He was very relaxed. He, he didn't even want to do a rehearsal. So. Uh -huh. He only trust me. <laughs> Very cool. Hey, the people are asking, yes. will Scott bring his violin out? And, oh. Oh, sorry. you know, will you be able to perform anything for us? And uh, I know the answer to that, but I'm going to let you answer that question. Um, I wish I could, but um, my violin is sleeping right now in the, in the, <laughs> in the guest room. So, <laughs> Your violin, it, it's tired. It's been practicing I mean, all day. I can, pl I can plug it in and just uh, play something, but um, it will be short. Okay. But do, you have okay. Any, do you have any questions? No, no questions? From the yeah, from no. We've, I've got tons of questions for you. I know that, Scott, you okay. also work with a manager who you're, you've got some projects <laughs> lined up and you, I, you know, yeah. they're kind of top secret. We can't talk about them just yet. Or maybe, I don't know. Yeah. You tell me. So... There's a movie coming out uh, next month on ne okay. Netflix. 
and it, I was part of a, a soundtrack with uh, Spike Lee. Very uh, cool. The new Spike Lee movie. And uh, also there's uh, somebody in the Zoom chat that is a good friend. Her name <gasps> is Moni Franklin. Wonderful. Well, hello. We're glad that. you're here. <laughs> uh, all right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my right in, I guess. Okay. So yeah. Well, is Cookie going to take the microphone while you're gone? Or no, it's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> you want it? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it'll give us something to look at, right? Back. I get. <laughs> hey, um, we've only got we've got 11 minutes, so you got to run. Oh yeah, Let's, let me do that. Okay. All right. So, guys, if you are just now joining us, I know it's late in the program, but first off, uh, thank you for joining us. And second off, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to submit, you can submit those to Claudia Taylor and she will um, get those to me. We'll hopefully try and address as many more as we possibly can. Uh, Scott's a really fascinating character and has tons of great stories. And I wish we had more time, but maybe we can do this again in the near future. Um, I know that there is an opportunity for those of you that are in the Zoom room to to fill out a survey and those that fill out the survey will be entered in to win a North Texas alumni prize pack. So you don't want to miss out on that opportunity and you'll want to stick around so you can get the link to that survey. And uh, looks like Scott has made his way back with the violin. Yeah. Can you hear me? I hope he's not, I hope he's not cranky is you no. didn't wake him up, you know, and no, upset him. Did fine. you? I'm going to, I'm going to play with my loop pedal. I have a loop pedal. Okay. So I'm going to create a loop. So everything I'm going to play is going to be recorded and then, all right, so I'm going to start with physical. Hey, Scott, right? yeah? can you pull the microphone closer? Oh. If it's possible? Yeah, but because I, I put it on the loop, so it's going to be oh, in, okay. the, in the room. So sure. yeah, it, let me know if you hear like anything, okay? Hit it. Can you hear? Yeah? Mm -hmm. okay. that's incredible thank you so much thank you that was no, such thank, a treat thank you it's it, I, I like to use the loop pedal a friend of mine told me to use it like a few years ago and i, I bought a, a full set of pedals so i can i can play solo it's nice it's nice to do. that's fantastic so scott the more i've talked to you and gotten to know you over the last couple of weeks as we've prepared for this show i i've been really really impressed with 
just the way you, I guess, interact with your students and you, you really provide them a quality education and you, you care about them, you look out for them and, and you encourage and foster this incredible learning environment. So, you know, I want to thank you for that. And I, I want to give Dean Richmond a huge shout out for, for discovering you and, and, and getting you here and bringing you here because our students are going to be so much better off because of this. And, and it's not just Scott. I mean, we've got an incredible, Incredible faculty at our, nice. in our music school. So um, I hope that you're enjoying it there. I'm hoping that uh, <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> are you are you traveling? You I don't just know uh, went to the other room. That's it. It's, uh, oh, okay. You just yeah. floated around. No big deal. Is what what kind of room is that? So this room is actually the presidential uh, suite from the French president. Perfect. It's exactly where you belong. It's office. This is office of a French president. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> it's, for, it's just a, I won't go anywhere. Else. Don't worry, guys. Uh, <laughs> this one is a it's a personal uh, retreat where I like to to write music, and after hours, when a happy hours is here, so I know. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. Hey, anyway. can you pass me? No. <laughs> uh, this one? Yes. No. No. To the right. Just a little bit. <laughs> that one yes yes <laughs> oh my gosh you uh, are a... so actually let me reveal the real place because i truly have a green screen and uh, so i have a green screen too you do <laughs> i mean it's green it's it's pretty special to me so <laughs> i'm not as talented as you technically to to that's, it. that's a real place <laughs> That's the real place. That's where the music's happening right now, virtually. So even even you're so you're teaching class from your living room these days, right? Yes. So it's where I'm teaching. It's where I do my performance. I have a set with microphones and everything I need. So usually I teach um, um, with this angle because it's perfect for it doesn't distract too much and it shows that I'm at home. So I kind of uh, you know sam sample. Right. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, when I teach uh, new students, but I don't know private, like private lessons, uh, I have a few um, students in China, in China, and uh, some wow. in Aust Australia, and in, in um, um, Germany. So that's fantastic. So yeah, I used to teach when I was in New York. I used to teach in uh, in Peru and uh, in uh, in Belgium, but wow. um, like it's always changing depending. Like sometimes I have a student for one year, two years. Sometimes. Just like a few lessons because, um, you know, depending on the, the schedule, the budget, and you know, I'm trying to make, make it work with everybody. Somebody from uh, uh, Lima in Peru uh, mm -hmm. was not able to afford the lessons. So I just uh, decided to do it for very, like somebody commands, you know, two, two dollars or something like this. But um, just um, because I, I, this person seems really, uh, seem really like, uh, interested and uh, passionate about it so i did i did that but yeah uh it depends i i i not encourage people to ask me for free but, <laughs> right but, uh, exactly when but I see you know, like a talent and a passion uh i can do i can do an effort and do so so what i'm hearing you say is you have a really big heart and i think the story that you told me a couple of days ago about how you were on a flight to new york oh, to yeah. go perform and you oh, yeah. So I was I was uh, on a flight. Oh, by the oh, way, we have like two minutes. We have two minutes. Okay. So I was not on the flight. I was like on my way to the airport. I oh, was okay. Drive, uh, I was on an Uber going to the airport DFW, and I I was going to New York City, and I could go to LA because I always go for a movie either in LA or New York. So I was on my way. I live ten minutes from the airport, and I got a phone call from the MD of uh, Kanye West, and he said, uh, "Man." I need you. Uh, Kanye is doing a, the, the Sunday service at the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, can you play? And I say, you can probably find any player in, in LA. I say, yeah, but I want you. I want you to be there. And I was like, wow, I, I wish I could do it. But I'm actually on my way to the airport to go play in New York with uh, the member of Sunra. It's their older musician and it's free jazz. And it, it didn't pay at all. The gig didn't pay. <laughs> so, and uh, the gig with uh, Kanye was paying a lot of money. And uh, I thought about it and I was like, wow, I mean, he said, 
he told me, you are already in the airport. I can get you a flight right now. You just have to take the flight to LA from DFW. And I had to say thank you, but I don't think I, I can do it because I felt really bad about it because when it was on the New York Times, he had bad reviews though, it's okay. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it was in the New York Times, so I was like, wow. I should it's because be you weren't it. there. Exactly. <laughs> because, yeah, see, it never worked. I think so, so, yeah, that is so. a true testament of your character. And I love <laughs> that you, you've got integrity and honesty and you, you're a man of your word and you take care of everything that you've committed to and you keep our students a priority. Um, so I just, I want to say thank you so much, number one, for taking a chance and, and moving to Texas and uh, making a difference for UNT and our students. And, and also thank you for your time this afternoon. And this has been such a treat. And um, so thank you one more time. And I really appreciate, I really appreciate you. I, I wanted to say also, and um, also uh, Claudia as well. And uh, um I've been, uh, I'm really surprised and uh, in a good way because I was um, coming again to a new city, a new uh, state, you know, after coming uh, coming from New York, first from Paris, I didn't know anybody in New York. I was very, very, um, like, actually, it was very hard for me to, to even meet people because I didn't speak English. And uh, I never took an English class, class, I should probably do. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I learned in the streets, basically, by listening to people. And uh, and now having somebody uh, here in Texas like you and uh, the people I meet that are very friendly and I feel like I can I can feel uh, comfortable and you know I have friends in LA I have friends in New York I have friends in Chicago uh, in different countries and uh, I feel like uh, we're all connected in the, with music and uh, with uh, being just open and not playing playing uh, uh, putting an armor you know. I see so many yeah. artists, and I'm not talking about uh, Stevie because Stevie is not like this; is, is open. And uh, but I'm t some artists that are not even that big, and they're always trying to put an armor, put like a, a, a fake facade, you know, to because they have insecurities and things. And I think it it, it shows um, how they're not in, in in touch with themselves because when when you an artist and you can really let go of the, the facade and the fakeness, you actually uh, do better music, better art because it's also being vulnerable, being a good musician, I think. I mean, uh, being a, a musician, like, not even good, but like. <laughs> right, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And I, I, once again, all of these words that you speak can apply to so many different areas of our lives. So, yes. you know, you're, you're wise beyond your years and it's it's been such a, a pleasure to get to know you and, and find out that you are not one of those guys, but decide, <laughs> and you're a pretty cool guy. So um, if you guys see Scott or <laughs> Professor Tixier around campus, say hi to him and uh, don't be afraid to, to you know, yeah, give him a- Don't be afraid, I'm, uh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, you can, uh, you can uh, 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 message me there. Um, uh, it's a good way. F Facebook, I don't really check my Facebook. But uh, if you send me a message and I don't, I didn't respond in like two months. It's because I didn't check my Facebook. <laughs> I post things, but I don't go on it. I go to Instagram or on WhatsApp on my phone, and also uh, my email. My email, I check it every day. So perfect, so perfect. <laughs> well, thank you. All right, Claudia, I'm going to turn it back over to you now to close wow. us out. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who took the time to join us today. I hope you enjoyed it. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Scott, and thank you, Casey.